service, Troma to Help. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning and I really hope that you enjoy the service today. A few announcements for you. As always, there's lots of stuff on the website that you can go and engage with. There is loads of stuff for the kids to go and look at. There's YF TV, which is for the YF, but everyone is welcome. It's usually only 10 minutes long, so I would definitely recommend that everyone go and watch it. And there is also some worship songs that the band has chosen to, so you can go and give those a listen. Also, there is going to be another communion service this Wednesday, a bit like what we did at Easter Friday, but there will be an email with details of that coming soon, so look out for that. As a church family, we are mourning the sad loss of Vera, who was called home to be with the Lord on Wednesday morning. Vera was such a committed servant in many areas of church life at Wood Hill, but in particular at the lunch club. She's a huge loss to our church family and the community and will be missed greatly by all her friends at the lunch club. Her love, care and witness are great examples to us all. Please pray for Alison and Stuart and the wider family here and in Ireland at this very difficult time as they come to terms with the loss of Vera. Please continue to remember all those in our church family who are mourning the loss of loved ones in recent weeks. This week we have a guest speaker, Alistair Noble. Alistair is a local preacher from Eaglesham where he lives with his wife, Ruth. He has previously been a part of the pastoral team at Craig Albert Church in Cumbernauld, as well as being very involved in the Scottish education system. He regularly lectures on topics in faith and science and will be joining us here at Wood Hill for the next three Sundays, speaking on episodes of Acts. This week, Alistair, we were looking at Acts chapter one and his subject is Ascension. So I'm just going to quickly pray and then Alistair will take it away with his sermon. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for us all being able to be here today and for the technology that we have to be able to do this online and be able to still be at church even though we're all in our different houses, Lord. I pray for Vera's family and all those who are mourning just now. I pray that you are with them and that you really walk alongside them right now, Lord. I also pray for members of our church family who are finding life difficult under the current restrictions and that you're able to help them and guide them, Lord. I also thank you for Alistair for the gift that you've given him and I thank you for all the preparation that he's put in over the past few weeks. Um, and I just really pray that you're with him and that you're with us and we hear what you have to say to us through Alistair this week and in the weeks to come. So I pray all of this in your name. Amen. Now, I had been looking forward to being with you at Bishop Briggs for these three Sundays in May, but uh, sadly it wasn't to be. Nonetheless, it's a pleasure for me to be able to join you electronically for this Sunday um, and for the next two. And I would like in these three Sundays to speak to you about some episodes from the Acts of the Apostles, a part of the Bible that I've been studying at some length over the last year or two. And so I want to read two passages, first of all, today, as we think about the ascension of Jesus into heaven after his resurrection. And the first passage I'd like to read to you is from the Gospel according to Luke and in chapter 24. And from verse 50, and we read, when Jesus had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. And then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. And then the second passage is in the Acts of the Apostles and in chapter 1, where Luke gives a fuller account of the ascension of Jesus into heaven. Reading from verse 3 of chapter 1, it says, After his suffering, Jesus showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times 
or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes in you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men, dressed in white, stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way as you have seen him go into heaven. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the Holy Scriptures. Now, in my experience, the ascension of Jesus into heaven is not an event that we have focused greatly on. Of course, we believe it, just as we believe that Jesus rose from the dead. But somehow, the ascension, in my experience, has not been something to which we've devoted a great deal of attention. May the 21st is a Thursday, and in the Christian calendar it's marked as Ascension Day. And traditionally in the church, there have been some celebration of this moment, this moment of victory, when Jesus ascended into heaven. Now last week we had VE Day on Friday, a day when this country was going to mark with considerable celebration the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. Sadly, these celebrations had to be somewhat curtailed. But uh, when I was looking at some of the film on television, uh, recording that day, colour film from 1945, I was struck by the overwhelming sense of joy and relief that the almost six years of war was over. I feel a kind of personal attachment with that day. I wasn't really there. I was born three weeks before it, on the 12th of April, 1945, actually the day that President Roosevelt died. Um, but I was alive when that happened, though all oblivious to it. But looking back over the years of my life, I'm thankful to God that I was born into a better and more peaceful world than the ones my parents, my, the one my parents experienced and many millions of others. And I'm thankful for that. In fact, I have recent, recently uh, written a book about it entitled Born in a Golden Age. And had I been with you, I'd like to have brought some copies. You can get copies from John Riches and Kilmarnock. They have a website and it's there. But if I get the chance to come again to Woodhill, I'll certainly bring some copies. And I thank God for the way in which I have been spared these horrors uh, and the kind of life I have lived. But what struck me about the VE Day celebrations was the sense of joy, the sense that this is over, and the anticipation of a better world. Now, without stretching the analogy, I was very struck recently when reading at the end of Luke's Gospel, after the disciples saw Jesus ascend into heaven, you would have thought they would have wanted to linger there. You would have thought there would have been a sense of nostalgia, a sense of loss, a sense of sadness that the Lord had gone, but actually it says they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Just as there had been joy when they realised that Jesus had risen from the dead, now there was this sublime joy that this same Jesus, who had come back again after the resurrection, in a resurrection body, had now ascended into heaven and gone back to heaven. This for them was a great victory, not a military victory, but a spiritual victory, a victory that underlined the fact that Jesus was Lord, King of Kings, and supreme in the universe. I have a book in my collection by Michael Green, the late uh, Anglican uh, vicar and evangelist and academic, a book called 30 Years That Changed the World. And this is how he begins the book. He says, three crucial decades in world history. That's all it took. In the years between AD 33 and 64, a new movement was born. In these 30 years, it got sufficient growth and credibility to become the largest religion the world has ever seen and to change the lives of hundreds of millions of people. 
It has spread into every corner of the globe and has more than two billion adherents. It has had an incredible impact on civilization, on culture, on education, on medicine, on freedom, and of course, on the lives of countless people worldwide. And the seedbed for all this, the time when it took decisive root, was in these three decades. It all began with a dozen men and a handful of women, and then the spirit came. Thirty years that changed the world from the Ascension and Pentecost until the gospel was carried in these 30 years almost to the extremities of the Roman Empire. We live in a strange time. Uh, in terms of public health, it's like nothing we've ever known before. It raises deep questions, philosophical and theological, about why this kind of thing happens. John Lennox has written a book recently entitled Where is God in a Coronavirus World? And you might be interested in getting a copy of that from the Good Book Company. Culturally, though, we live in a strange time as well. And this has been going on for a long time. I'm kind of saddened that in the last decade or two of my life, I have watched the Christian foundations of our country eroded and a departure from the Christian civilization that we have known for so long. And you can exaggerate that, of course, but it's a very real thing. And I notice a, a number of authors, a number of writers, are looking at this loss of Christian faith in our society. Douglas Murray has a book called The Madness of Crowds. And he talks about the strange situation in which we live. And this is what he says. People in wealthy Western democracies today could not simply remain the first people in recorded history to have absolutely no explanation for what we are doing here and no story to give life's, life purpose. The question of exactly what we are meant to do, other than get rich and have whatever fun is an offer, is going to have to be answered by something. And this is a peculiar age for Christians to witness in, an age unlike the decades that most of us and our forefathers have known. So it is a challenging time for Christians, a virus that originated in China, has closed churches worldwide. And for us, this is a period of waiting, a period of being creative in terms of communication, but a time to be thinking about renewing our faith and our commitment to Christ. If life won't be quite the same again after this, what will church be like? Now, that's a question that we have to think about very seriously indeed. Now let me come back to the ascension of Jesus. There are three dimensions to the ascension that I'd like to mention briefly and for each of us to think about. First of all, this was clearly an historic moment. The disciples had become used to the thrilling sequence of events, devastated by the crucifixion of Jesus. They were now to, to witness him ascending into heaven and to watch him caught up between those angels and ascend into heaven itself. Acts chapter 1 says that Jesus gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. And these convincing proofs are proofs that we too can visit. We can be sure that this actually happened and that Jesus actually ascended into heaven. Over the years, I have become interested in apologetics and interested in the reasons why we believe what we believe. And of course, the resurrection stands as the basis of our faith. There is a feeling in our scientific age that people would say, well, surely you can't believe in the resurrection. I mean, this is a kind of unscientific, unusual matter. But the tests of the resurrection are really historical tests. And when you examine the evidence for the resurrection, you see, as the late Professor William Barclay once said, that it is the best attested fact in history. 
I remember when I was a student being given a book called Who Moved the Stone by Frank Morrison. Frank Morrison was a lawyer who set out as a skeptic to disprove the resurrection of Jesus, thinking that this was fantastic. And yet, by examining the evidence, came to the conclusion that the resurrection was an historic event. He talks about how the stone was rolled away and the story that the soldiers put out that while they slept, the disciples came and stole the body of Jesus. And as a lawyer, he said, I would like to put them in the dock and I would like to ask them this question. How did you see what happened when you were asleep? And every attempt to explain away the resurrection of Jesus found us on these kind of points. The resurrection of Jesus is a certain fact of history and the basis of our faith. On one occasion, Paul talks about Jesus being seen by 500 brothers at one time and then adds, interestingly, of whom most are still alive. And one commentator on that says, this is the kind of incidental evidence that underlines the authenticity of it because you wouldn't say that most of whom are still alive inviting people to go talk to them if you weren't certain that Jesus had actually risen from the dead this is what's known as the ring of truth and into that category falls the ascension of Jesus this is an actual event Luke tells us that before their very eyes Jesus was caught up into heaven but the second thing I'd like to say about it is that it was not only an historic moment, but it was a defining moment because it was to define their new relationship to Christ and to define the nature of their mission. In a, pa in a passage of daily readings that John Stott has produced, he writes this about the ascension of Jesus. He says, the reason for a public and visible ascension is surely that he wanted the disciples to know that he had gone for good. During the 40 days, he had kept appearing, disappearing, and then reappearing. But now the interim period was over. This time, his departure was final. So they were not to wait around for his next resurrection appearance. Instead, they were to wait for someone else. They were to wait for the Holy Spirit. And so in this sense, there, this was a defining moment for them, for it marked the end of the earthly ministry of Jesus and marked the beginning of another ministry where they would be, as he says, my witnesses to the ends of the earth, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. I sometimes say with tongue in cheek that Acts chapter 1, verse 8 is the only verse from the Bible where Scotland is mentioned. The ends of the earth in the Roman Empire would, of course, have included old Britain and old Scotland. But anyway, they were to become now not his disciples so much who travelled with him, but his witnesses to the ends of the earth. The word witness is taken from the Greek word martyr, from which we get the English word martyr. And that's a solemn challenge. He called upon his disciples to be faithful even unto death if necessary, and their relationship with him was that they were now to be his hands and his feet to carry his ministry into all the world. But there is a second element of this. It was a defining moment in terms of their personal relationship with him. And in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14, we have this passage which says, we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens Jesus, the Son of God, and let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but we, who, we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And so the ascension of Jesus marks this changing relationship to Jesus. Our connection to Jesus is now that he is our great high priest and that he represents us in heaven as his people and that he cares for us and that he guides us. 
Hebrews chapter 4, the passage I've just read to you, urges us to think about the position of Jesus at the right hand of God, the experience of Jesus, that he has been tempted in every way, just as we are. He knows what it is like to be in this world. And the gifts of Jesus, his mercy and his grace to sustain us as Christians who witness for him in this world. A historic moment, a decisive moment. And thirdly, I want to say to you, this is a prophetic moment. For it is in this moment that we are reminded, Acts chapter 1, verse 11, that this same Jesus will come again. It says, as they were standing, looking up into heaven, the angel said to them, this same Jesus will come in like manner as you have seen him go. Apparently C.H. Spurgeon in the 19th century was a bit sceptical about the Plymouth Brethren as they developed, and on one occasion rather caustically said, ye men of Plymouth, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This was because the Plymouth Brethren, um, among the many things that they were enthusiastic about, was a sense of the coming again of Christ. And to give them credit, they recovered one of the doctrines that the church was in danger of losing and is still in danger of losing a sense that Christ is coming again. And this is the central hope of the church, to be reminded that at the end of time, Christ will come again. I'm not someone who dwells at great length upon the signs uh, of his coming, but they, they are there. Jesus talked about how the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed, AD 70 how the gospel would be preached in all the world, how Jerusalem would be occupied by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Remarkably, part of Jerusalem came into Jewish hands in 1948 at the foundation of the State of Israel. And then after the Six Day War in 1967, the Israelis took control of the city, the whole city of Jerusalem and Moshe Dayan, the general um, and defence chief at that time said, we have been reunited with our holiest of holy places, never to be separated from them again. Interesting that Jerusalem is no longer in the, being trampled down by the Gentiles. We're also told that before the coming of Christ, there will be a great apostasy. And we're also told that the elements when Christ comes will melt with fervent heat something I think only really understandable in the nuclear age. Yes, there are signs there, but we cannot know for sure when Christ will come again. What we know for sure is that Jesus who ascended into heaven will certainly come again. Today is the 10th of May, and on the 10th of May, 1941, a very strange thing happened in the village where I live. Rudolf Hess, Hitler's deputy, got into a plane and flew from Germany to Britain on a secret peace mission. He parachuted into Scotland and he landed here in Eagleson, just half a mile from where I'm sitting in my study. As I look out across the fields, I can almost see the place where he landed. He broke his ankle in landing at a crofter's cottage and he was led in by the farmer and sat down by the fire and his wife said to him, you'll want a cup of tea. But it was the last cup of tea he ever had in, in as a free man, for he was taken prisoner and uh, eventually ended up in the Tower of London, later moved to Spandau Prison and was there for 46 years until his death in 1987. It's a strange and mysterious thing that nobody really knows what that was about and his mission was clouded in mystery. But when I think about our mission and the mission that Christ has given us, there's nothing mysterious about it. There's nothing hidden about it. In his ascension, Jesus says, you are going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And so you and I need to take seriously, how are we going to represent Christ from now on in this world? How are we going to represent him in this difficult time? And how are we going to represent him when all of this is over. We are called to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth, and that includes modern Scotland. 
Let me finish with one more incident from wartime. This goes back to the to Christmas time, 1939. King George VI made his first wartime Christian first Christmas radio broadcast, and the nation was at that time in the midst of a phony war. They expected bombing, but it hadn't come. The Navy, the German Navy, was harassing the Atlantic convoys, but nobody was quite sure what was going to happen next. It was a dark and dangerous time. And uh, he quoted a poem, a poem called, from, uh, from a poem called God Knows, written by Minnie Louise Haskins, which was published in 1908. And it has these lines that have become very famous. And I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, Give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go out into the darkness and put your hand in the hand of God. That shall be better than light and safer than a known way. I put these words on a slide with one change. And I would ask you to say them with me now as I conclude my message to you. Let's say these words together as they appear on the screen. Go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of Christ. That shall be better than light and safer than a known way. Thank you for listening and may God bless you. Amen.